Well, hello everyone. Thank you for joining our webinar today. You're joining a Marion County Environmental Services webinar because we have had to come up with some creative ways to communicate with our community through a series of online events and webinars to help people stay informed of solid waste issues and updates. Our topics have been as diverse as climate change and materials management to recycling and in this, in this particular one about repair. Uh, to find out where the next event will be taking place or to view previous recordings, you can just click on mcrecycles.net and go to virtual links and you'll get there. But for right now, here we are talking about Repair Revolution, this newest book that just came out by two authors that are joining us today, John Wackman and Elizabeth Knight, who have combined together their forces to create this wonderful book, which we'll talk about and talk about repair fairs and a lot of other things. And I would like to give you just a, a brief introduction to both of these folks who have amazing bios. Uh, I'll start with John who, who lives in Kingston, New York. He founded the very first repair cafe in New York state and now describes his role as that of a coordinator, communicator and cheerleader for repair cafes in the Hudson Valley, Catskills and Capital District of New York, uh, as well as repair everywhere. And prior to that, he was a writer and TV producer for over three, three decades, including work with the um, National Public Television and several cable networks. So John, you've been a busy fellow. Elizabeth Knight is also the author of, she's also the author of four books. She is a, this is interesting, a tea and entertaining expert and the former tea, I'm gonna mispronounce this again because we don't speak French in Arkansas, Somalia <laughs> for the St. Regis Hotel, where she was a frequent guest on, on uh, national on TV and radio programs. Well, yeah, who doesn't want to talk to the Somalia for tea? <laughs> she's also been a marketing manager for some very large national brands, but somewhere along the way, she shifted her life to become a sustainability activist and community organizer. And so the two, yes. oh my gosh, synergy here. That's what I'm thinking. That's what brought us together. Yeah, mm -hmm. so thank you both for, for joining us today and wanting to talk about your book and, and all this stuff. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna throw you a question. And so I'll give this first to Elizabeth, okay? Okay. So um, you'll, you'll be our, our um, Helen Thomas. Get off. She's got the first question from the president. So I'll pretend, no, I'm not gonna pretend. Um, so why is repair important? Tell us, tell us, get us started on that. Elizabeth. The short answer is because the resources we have are limited. We can't keep making things, using them once, throwing them away because we either can't be bothered or don't know how to repair something. We've had a whole generation at least who doesn't even know the notion of repair or reuse and we can't continue that way. Okay. John, you want to add to that? Yeah, sure. And you know, it, what, what we're learning through this is we're learning how to be more than consumers. We're learning how to be fixers and we're starting to fix our world. And that is a very important, a very important transformation of our culture. Um, and these repair cafes, you know, one thing that we want to make sure everyone knows is yes, there are repair cafes, but you there have your repair fair and share, which we think is a just a marvelous idea. Uh, there are fix-it clinics, there are repair hubs and repair labs. My goodness, in Chicago, there's something called the Community Glue Workshop. But we are all doing the same thing. We are giving our fellow citizens the opportunity to repair things rather than always throwing away or buying new. This is a really important choice to have. Yes. And also uh, tool libraries, as um, the, oh, yes. someone pointed out in the book, <laughs> that the average drill is used for 13 times in its life, and you don't need the drill, you need the hole. So you don't have to buy the equipment, you can check it out of a library there across the country, just as you would check out a book. Yeah, and I think we're, we're going to get into some of those options. And so that's a, that's a great point, Elizabeth, um, because there are so many ways to avoid buying something that you don't need because you're not going to use it very often. And so I think that for me, wants to get into that idea of, when, in my world, we talk about the three R's. We talk about reduce, reuse, repa um, and recycle. And yeah. recycling being the one we give the most uh, airtime to because everybody does it at some level. 
and they feel good about it. But the idea, but the reality is, it's reduce and reuse are really the key to cutting greenhouse gases, reducing uh, pollution and environmental um, uh, contamination. And there's so many things based around it. Um, yeah. And so when we we talk about that, re, in order to keep items to be able to be reused, repair is an essential feature of that, right? In order to yes. keep those items going. And I wanna to go to this, this next slide um, that I put on here, looking at the differences between when somebody's buying as an owner of something versus a consumer. And some of the items that, that we, some of the I, things that we come up against when we're talking about the three R's is, is when people buy for those items on the left as an owner, that, you know, you're something you want to keep for a long term. These are what the, these are the, the characteristics you're looking for. Something that is going to be durable. It's going to be long lasting, and um, hopefully you can repair it if it breaks. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I know, Design for example, for even if she's got a water bottle in that picture. Yeah. I'm thinking, well, you know, those uh, hydro flasks. Um, they have one thing that's that's kind of a, a, a feature I have found. Uh, that sometimes is their is their downfall is the the caps might break. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. but the company then will instead of you having to get a whole new water bottle, the company there will either repair it or they will reply replace it for you so that yeah. your water bottle continues. Because that plastic piece is an easy one enough to fix or to replace, but that whole metal piece that's to the bottom is is expensive and it's a yeah. it's a it's a key metal. Whereas I, yeah. I wanted to say a note about this illustration. Uh, this is in our book, but it was created by, uh, you'll see at the lower left, it says PLAN, P-L-A-N. That stands for Post Landfill Action Network. The significant thing here is this is college students. Uh, it was started at the University of New Hampshire. It is now active on more than 80 campuses across the country and then also around the world. And so it's really, it's really great that you know, this generation is, is uh, more than taking an interest, they're taking action. Yeah, absolutely. And so another, I'm, I'm glad to point out this is from your book because there was another one in your book, this one. Mm -hmm. Oh yes. One of you guys wanna take that one? Uh, John found that image, which is terrific. Let John take that one. Okay. So this is, you know, here we have the, the, the three uh, systems of, of how we deal with the resources in our world. And the one on the left is, you know, is your linear. And so that has been the dominant economic model since the dawn of the Industrial Revolution. Mm -hmm. And it is, you know, it's the extraction of materials uh, the manufacture of the materials, you use them, and then you toss them. So it's the take, make, waste philosophy of life. <laughs> and it is not sustainable. Um, you know, so then in the middle, you've got, you know, you've got recycling. Well, recycling, you know, has some uh, things to recommend it, but we've been, you know, treating it as the first thing to do, when in fact, it is the last thing we should do, because it doesn't really it's not really circular it also can you know contributes to this to this as we say the mountain of waste and so it's really the circular economy that's that's the goal and this has really become uh you know the the, the economic model that is taking is its center stage uh on in the in the world view so you will see it being discussed and uh and played out through many industries. The, the idea is that, well, and, and here's the factoid that is really kind of jaw dropping. 80% of the environmental impact of the things that we buy is determined at the design stage. Yeah, that's a big one, right? Yeah, it's a big and so one. So that's Just where we get into that, that circular economy. So if, and, 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 and gives me an opportunity to toss out the fact that um, extended producer responsibility is another mm -hmm. avenue that we can use to, but through legislation, which is to force the, um, the manufacturers to be responsible for their products so that if they make it, um, they need to, at the end of life, they need to find something to do with it. And hopefully they would design it in a way that it could be quickly put back into the economy versus just landfilled. And I think if they were economically in charge of that, 
then they would do better. Um, yeah. So that's what there's, extended producer responsibility is all about. Yeah, there's a, a very interesting study, uh, social marketing study done at um, Boston University. And it basically showed that when people have the opportunity to recycle, well, they're happy to do that, but it also em encourages them to use more. So what, you, what you've got is recycling simply leads to greater consumption. And that's not, that's not, you know, that's not going to help us in the long term. Correct. So let's, let's get to, let's get to what we're, we're what our main subject is here today, because all this, cool. all, everything we're going to talk about in fits in with everything we've talked about so far, but let's look at repair fairs and repair cafes. And you guys use a lot of different terminology. You've got fix it clinics, you got repair cafes. Well, we the idea is that the repair fair here in Marion County, yeah. and then you got a course, and then Elizabeth touched on a, a tool library. Mm -hmm. So let's let's clarify those. Well, um, the repair cafe model is. Does everybody know even what what a repair cafe is or how it got started? A Dutch journalist in two thousand nine who wrote about sustainability had just given the birth to her second child. She was walking down the sidewalk one day and saw all of these things that, as she says, were not that broken piled up on the sidewalk and thought, "I don't want to leave a world like this for my child. This is not sustainable." So she talked to a friend who had a um, movie theater and asked if she could hold a pop-up repair event in the lobby of the movie theater. And she reached out to the community to find people who knew how to fix things. And she said, these were the people who, given the way we just consume, buy stuff, and as you said, toss it, they weren't valued, they weren't even noticed. So she created the Repair Cafe as a place, a community meeting place, free, where people could bring things in and have a coach sit with them and work with them to repair it in hopes that the people would learn to do it themselves. At a fix, a fix it clinic is a similar movement, and John can tell you more about that with Peter Mui. Well, uh, you know, the, the, the fact is that there's nothing proprietary about getting a group of people together in your community to fix stuff. And you can call it whatever you want. And there is, there's a great commonality among all of these, you know, iterations of community repair. Uh, Peter Mui, who's down in the, in the Bay Area, uh, started the Fix-It Clinics nationwide. And they are, they are mostly um, focused on electronic products. And they are very adamant about the idea when you bring your product, you're going to learn how to fix it too. And I would say in our world, in Elizabeth and my world, we are happy to have people come. And, and the important thing to know is that none of these are drop-off services. That is not part of the deal. You bring your item and you sit down across the table with the person who is going to give it their attention. And this might be you know, mechanical, electrical, electronic. Important to know that clothing and textiles are a very you know, popular part of this picture as well. And so fixing, repairing, and mending. And, uh, and you know, so you've, you've brought your item, you're gonna sit down and you're going to tell the story of that item. Why does it have meaning? What is it not doing that it's supposed to be doing? And when you start to tell that story, that really is the beginning of repair. And often beginning repair begins when, with people who did this as kids. We found that many of the people we call repair coaches were like Michelle, who runs the one in Green Austining, who used to, who wrote, um, we sent out a questionnaire when we were getting ready to write the book about, to the organizers to share with the volunteers. She said when she was a kid, she used to sit underneath the dining room table with a screwdriver in her hand during dinner to try to take things apart. And for many of the coaches, like the in the, the photo where it says kids take a part table, many of those coaches also had that same sense of problem solving and that taking things apart and learning how they work was fun. And the man who runs the kids take it apart table in Warwick, New York, um, he, work, he does it with his two sons. That's his youngest, his uh, six-year-old now, Eli, and his eight-year-old. And the mom who volunteers to do the sewing uh, repairs is one of our uh, sewists. 
So the kids never resent having to come to the repair cafe that they think that's fun. And Jim has a whole list of things um, in, about what kinds of items are safe for kids to take apart. He takes the plug out. We have little tiny screwdrivers. It's not just playtime. Jim walks them through about the proper way to hold the tool. Um, he tells them what it is that they're looking at and how it works and what kinds of things. Uh, we had a woman bring in a hairdryer one time and the description of it was, well, when I turn it on, it smokes and it smells bad. And the repair coach she'd taken it to said, you know, this one's done and done and gone. And she said, okay, where's the, where's the recycle bin? And he said, no, take it to the kids, take it apart table and ask Jim if that's safe for the kids to do, to work on. And she said, you know, this is what she called it was the reuse PlayStation. Mm -hmm. And yeah. that's, a, that's a great uh, tip there, Elizabeth, because we've never, um, set up a, a, a something like this at any of our repair fairs and I love that idea of having a place for kids to tinker oh yeah it's and really it's really uh, popular I mean grandparents bring their grandkids to repair cafe just for that and here's the thing is that when you talk to kids these days a lot of them do not even realize that things can be repaired yes what they know of the world is that when something breaks, you throw it away and get a new one. So this whole idea that repair is possible is, a, is, is kind of a, a revelation. And what it does is it takes repair and puts it into the learning context. We think that's really important. We have a whole you know, emphasis, and you'll see this in the book, on a repair in the classroom. There is so much that kids can learn from that. One teacher, um, who, uh, Mr. Whitney, Michael Whitney, uh, mm. he, there was a, in his school, uh, they had a week where the teachers could create, uh, you know, unusual sort of experiences for their students. And so what he did is he, he created Mr. Whitney's Fix-It Club. And, and so he gathered the kids together who were interested in this and they roamed the school and found things within the school building that needed to be repaired. They also invited their friends to bring things from home. At the end of that week, they had repaired more than 100 items. They had a you know, big assembly of the entire school. They showed off what they had repaired. And, and then out of that came a weekly after school club that several years later is still going. The kids just, you know, they, it is a tremendous learning opportunity. I love that. Yeah. Michael had said that this had originally been done with the really young kids at school. And at the end of the first presentation at the assembly, the older kids wanted to do it. And now they, they have the club that meets once a week all throughout the school year. Yeah, and here's the dynamic. Michael says that I fix things so that people will tell a story about how they were fixed. Excellent. That oh. is the way it travels. So. When somebody comes to a repair fair, I want to think about when, we, for example, the ones we have, and this seems like the same areas when um, you talked about in your book, here's some of the items that would be available to be repaired at that. And, and not all of the repair fairs that we did offered all of these. So you guys want to talk about that? Elizabeth, you want to get started? Uh, thinking sure. about um, why these... Items would be ones that would be most likely or, or whatever thing, other things you might add? Well, the most likely is under small appliances. We found that across the country, the most popular item brought in for repair over and over again is that one of our coaches, it's lots in all caps of ugly lamps. Mm. Um, but it's often because those lamps have a story as, as John and I like to say, it's, it's, as he said at the beginning, it's either things that you depend upon or things that mean something. At our very first repair cafe, we had a little nine-year-old girl bring in a lamp that was part of a pair that had um, set on her grandmother's nightstands and grandma was no longer with us. And the little girl wanted the nightlight and fix it. Bob sat down with her and the mom and showed him how you change the switch. Among, we also see uh, computers, clothing, textiles, bikes, but among the more, um, and knife and tool sharpening, which is extremely popular. I still remember the woman who came in with a drawer full of knives one time and said, you know, I was planning to go out for dinner tonight, but I'm going to go home and cook. But among the more unusual ones, at John's Repair Cafe in New Paltz, they have a wordsmith 
Vern Benjamin is a journalist and he's written two books about the history of the Hudson Valley. And you can bring in your resume, your resignation letter or any other written document you need help with. And he has a conversation with you so that the final written product is in your voice, not his. Um, he sits next to a gentleman who, Don Grease, I believe is his name, who does repair digital repairs to valuable old faded photographs. Um, another place um, that people have unusual, uh, in Kingston, I think it is, they have a, a Spanish speaking person who will help uh, people who are non-English speakers fill out documents and answer questions. There's also John, help me. Oh, the, the two women who know each other, the two licensed massage therapists who actually do massages at West Point and for the U.S. Tennis Open Association Games in New York City in Queens. And they do um, body massages because as one of them yeah. says, it's wear and tear on our bodies too. And you need to take care of yourself first before you can repair the rest of the world. Yeah. So those are 10 minute chair repair sessions, but you know, <laughs> there people do love it. And so here's the, here's what we say is that at a repair cafe, bring a beloved but broken item to be repaired by or with an expert who is also your neighbor. So that is the core dynamic is the people who have these skills live in your town and you better believe they do. You, you have those skills, every town has those skills. So it's really a matter of, who's willing to bring those skills forward and share them with their neighbors. Well, those are the skills that you will be able to offer at your repair event, you know? Um, and so just as Elizabeth says, it expands into all kinds of unexpected categories. So oh, and it's also an opportunity, I'm sorry, it's also an opportunity for organizations to come and present information uh, whenever we get one of the new uh, recycling and reuse uh, proclamations from our county recycling coordinator. They'll have a table there. We often have um, people who come in and measure uh, blood pressure and give advice um, on a healthy diet and even provide healthy snacks. Wow, that's a lot of, yeah. that's, a, that's an expanded uh, view of repair. I love that. Um, so- Oh, we have library books too. People bring in books about how to repair things and we have a take it, take it table. Very cool. So how, do, how does one, if, if someone was getting started on all this, how would they, how would they find all these volunteers? <laughs> what's, a, what's a good way to get started on that? A really good way to get started is to first look for the people in your community who are busy, the kind of people who already volunteer at any kind of community outreach, whether it's um, the food bank or they work for as a volunteer fireman. It's people who are active in the community to start with. You also want to look for um, organizations like libraries, churches, who support the notion of repair, whether it's uh, to repair the world, uh, rather to take care of the world. They're big hosts and fans of repair events. Mm -hmm. um, you want to do a really broad outreach. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, and I would suggest that the place to start is to identify the people in your community who do this professionally. Uh, and you may, uh, you may say, well, my goodness, uh, this is their livelihood. Why would they want to volunteer and give it away? But we know from experience that there's really no better way for a person who's doing professional repair to be out in the community so that people know who they are and what they have to offer. And, you know, most repair events are, you know, they're not every week by any means. They're maybe once a month or once every two months or even once every three or six months. You know, it's not that often, but it's a tremendous opportunity to sort of build the, you know, the recognition and, you know, the um, awareness of repair in our lives. Another, as Elizabeth was saying, libraries are a great resource. And, in, and so, you know, at every library you have uh, people with, you know, certain interests who meet uh, regularly. So when you, you know, go to your library and see what their schedules are. Now, we haven't yet talked about what's going on during the pandemic, because, you know, uh, of, as everyone on this call knows, all, you know, sort of our regular gathering opportunities have been suspended. And that is true for community repair as well. So, you know, 
part of what we're saying is that, you know, now is a great time to think ahead and, uh, and, and, and determine who within your community can you partner with to make community repair initiative you know, happen in your town. Libraries are tremendous partners. Librarians have been champions of community repair. And why is that? Well, it is hands-on learning. It is intergenerational. It brings people to the library who may not have been there in a while. All the things that librarians love. So the American Library Association has been a tremendous proponent of community repair. And I started my repair cafe and I was fairly new to the community. So I went to the reference desk at my local library and said, I need somebody who knows how to do wooden repairs. What do you suggest? And sure enough, somebody said, call the historical society and ask for so-and-so. And he, he volunteered to work with us, Ed. Yeah, it really is the impulse that, that is at the heart of this, is that in every community, there are people who have these skills. They have this know-how. There's an insight that you can trace back to Aristotle, that one of the greatest sources of human enjoyment is being able to enact your knowledge, to be able to show people, to share it. Uh, that is deeply gratifying for people. And, you know, this whole, this whole uh, subject of troubleshooting, you know, troubleshooting to many people is simply an irresistible proposition. And you never know what you're going to get. We have one of the, the women uh, who's one of our sewists. If you're not familiar with the term, I wasn't. This is the new one. You don't call ladies who sew seamstresses anymore. It's a combination of the word sew and artist. One of them had a, um, a retirement business, get this, of when you've inherited a fur coat that you don't want for whatever reason, you can take it to Joan and she will make a custom teddy bear out of the fur and she'll cut out the lining to make a little scarf, the lining with the person's monogram as a scarf. And then she'll suggest that you donate the leftover fur to the Humane Society, line the cages for the animals that they bring in. Yeah. Wow. So, Alan, we have a whole chapter and the title of the chapter is how do I get one in these? How do I get one of these in my town? Right. Wow. So that's the thought. how do I get one of these in my town? And that, in fact, is the question that we get asked all the time. People will come to a repair cafe from some town, you know, a few miles away and they'll say, oh, my gosh, this is so cool. How do we get one of these in my town? Well, of course, the answer is they have to be homegrown, you know, uh, and every every repair, you know, fair or repair cafe or fix it clinic is a product of each community. But, um, uh, you know, our book really walks you through it. Our book is full of really surprising things. You know, if you were picking up a book about repair, uh, we have loaded this book with things that you might not expect. And I, it's, and I was just going to point that out, John, because your book really does uh, point out how to, everything about it. I mean, it really does pe walk people through the, through the stages. Uh, what I liked about it, too, besides also giving a lot of the, uh, philosophy, which we kind of toyed with it in some parts during this uh, conversation, but also the fact that you've, you've even got repair tips and there are certain things like, and so I started talking about like vacuum cleaners, you know, people walk over vacuum cleaners and just boom, they're done. And a lot of times it's just a friggin' belt, you know, um, and it's- Or cat it's, fur, a lot of cat fur. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's, it's, it's so easy, right? But if, if yeah. you don't know and you're not challenged and you don't think you can fix it on your own, it sometimes is pretty liberating for somebody to find out like, oh, that's all it is? That kind of, yeah. that kind of aha moment. Yeah. Right? What is at the center of this? What is at the heart of this is that when we take up you know, when we consider the act of repairing, we're really talking about the ethics and the practice of care. You know, caring for our things, sure, but also caring for each other, caring for our communities, caring for our planet. That is really the spirit of the repair movement, and it is global. Yeah. I, I love that. And, and one last thing that I want to talk about for the book was um, when you... One, one of the key things besides finding the people is you got to have a, a good place for it, right? Mm -hmm. where, where would you suggest on a, on just a, not knowing a community, you know, not, not having ever been there, where would you say, try these three places? Where would you, what would you say? Oh, Elizabeth, you should take this, but we're you're talking about who can you partner with? Right. Uh, 
what you're going to look for is in, in a physical setting, you want, if it's a municipal setting, you, you want to look for a, as a physical place to hold it. Is there enough, is it close to public transportation ideally? Because not everybody um, has the means to travel a long distance. So next to public transportation, if possible, large parking lot, if possible, because you're gonna need a place for all the coaches to come, unload their stuff, move their cars away from the door for the room for the people who are coming, the visitors who need things fixed. You're going to want ideally a place that's all on one level with more than one bathroom. It's great if it has a kitchen, but you've got to have running water. You need to have a lot of natural light and you need a lot of electrical outlets for sewing machines and other small uh, repair tools. But in terms of partners, mm -hmm. um, houses of worship, because they've already got the mindset that, that we as individuals are responsible for the care of the earth, that it's a gift, it's a finite gift. So you need a partner with that kind of thinking. Um, some, many of them are held in school gyms and you've got the advantage there of the school's outreach department will help you promote your repair cafe. It's also a really good place to get kids who need community service hours to come volunteer for a repair cafe. Um, mine is held in the senior center of the town hall complex. So we don't have to pay rent, you, rent for the, the space. You want a place where the, the people who are offering you the space understand the benefits that having a repair cafe is going to bring to their their community and also to the larger community. Does that make sense? It does uh, indeed. The partners are, are as a, a very long list. So as we say, schools, libraries, churches, town halls, community centers, senior centers, historic homes, museums. It is. Um, it, it just goes, oh, art, art galleries, my goodness. There oh, is, you oh, know, workspaces. Yeah, uh, co-working spaces, yes. Thank uh, you. This is just like, you know, it, let's not lose, you know, sight of the fact that this is both fun and just super creative. Yes. And I would like to um, segue into uh, my last slide here, which is a list of, of resources that people might, that are listening to this or see the, watch the uh, uh, YouTube version. Um, look at this, there's a link there to your book if somebody wants to purchase it. Um, and then you guys also, um, got, there's Repair Cafe USA also offers some uh, tips on how to do it. Um, John, you sent me this link today, this Portland Repair Finder. Here it is practically right underneath my nose and I didn't know this, this link. Oh my goodness. Here. Oh, so Alan, this is really important. Yeah, so we're here we're talking about rebuilding the repair economy. You know, repair needs to be brought back into, you know, a, as, a, as a core cultural value. And, mm -hmm. and so the folks in, in Portland have created this tremendous network that matches people up, you know, the people who need the repairs with the people who do the repairs. It's a great thing. Well, I, I sent that link to my supervisors and then on up above and I said, I'm dreaming here, but... Um, I would love to see, I, I see a grant that somebody's going to get and they'll get some third party to create one of these for the uh, Marion okay. County area and we will help fund it. We will help uh, uh, maintain it, but somebody need, we need to get this going. This is and the people in Portland that, you know, are, will be so helpful to you. Yeah, <laughs> no question right. about it. You it's know, this is... Easier. Not this repair really movement is really global and the tremendous, you know, mutual support uh, is, you know, it's just boundless. Yes. And so also all look for local sustainability clubs and other green organizations. Many of them are very popular with both um, students, college students who are studying uh, the new green economy and sustainability, and also a lot of retirees who have a lot of, lot of skills to bring to it. Mm -hmm. And I also want to point out, we've, we, we've done some of these. Uh, what we would love to do, because we're, we're a small staff, uh, we, we try to do at least one a year. Sometimes we had two a year. And, and of course, nobody's putting them on right now because of COVID. But mm. that's, that's got to end. Um, and I'm predicting it is going to end sometime soon. So how, that's, that's a firm prediction, right? And, uh, and then we've, we've got some ideas there on our website not nearly as extensive as, as, as it is elsewhere, but we, we do have a list of the volunteers that we've had. 
we've got some ideas too that can help you get started. Because what we really want to do is we want people in these other communities, we kind of had these mostly in Salem, but I'd love to see this start taking on in all the other communities of any size in Marion County oh. um, and wherever. I mean, we've got people tuned in here today, uh, John Elizabeth, all the way over to Hawaii. Um, wow. And so aloha, folks. Um, oh, and, uh, Cafe in Honolulu. Yeah, there you and go. A tool, a tool library in Honolulu as well. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, we right, Elizabeth, we wrote this book to encourage and inspire a repair initiative of any kind. But there should be everywhere. Every town ought to have one. Yeah. And, and we when John says, how do I get one of these in, in my town? Um, it's from all the tips and things that we learned that would have made it easier had somebody told us. So it, it, I had somebody send me a note the other day saying this is really a repair cafe Bible. You don't have to know anything other than to just f flip the page. It's there. Oh, oh yeah. yeah, it is a Bible for sure for, for, for all this. So you, you guys did a great job. You really lined it out nice. So I'm, uh, I'm, a, I'm a cheerleader. I'm a fan Thank now. You. Uh, Thank so you. I'm, I'm glad I got, a, got the chance to see the book. Um, so what I'd like to do now is like to segue into some Q&A because we've got some great questions lined up here and I'm going to um, flip over here and I'm going to let, uh, oh, there it is. There's a note right there from chat says we're calling from the big island. So hello. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so uh, Rachel, are you there? I am. Okay, Rachel, you got some questions for us? Um, I'm asking everybody if they want to start um, putting in their questions now. Um, but the first one we do have is, is there a tool lending library in Salem? Well, I'll, I'll go ahead and take that one because um, there isn't yet. Um, and the Salem City Library um, uh, has, agree has wanted to do this uh, for some time, but they're going through the seismic upgrade. And so they, they've just said, we can't take anything on until we're back in the building. So they're at a temporary building right now. Um, that's supposed to all end uh, th sometime this spring. And so once they're back in their building, they are, uh, they are looking at to get a grant from the Department of Environmental Quality to get funding to start their own library of things. So, yeah. And two libraries, I uh, just want to say, two libraries are typically uh, started by millennials, 20-somethings, 30-somethings. That's where the energy behind two libraries is. Okay. All right. And we have a great question from Sharon. Um, where do you get the parts to repair things? Do you save parts for each event? Oh. Yes, we oh. do save parts. Um, many, it's a good idea for each repair organization to appoint one person who's responsible for say, the, the parts for the lamp supply box, the plugs, the switches, the rest of it. That person keeps track of what we need. That person stores the materials at home. Um, and uh, in, in our case, it's Fix It Bob. Fix It Bob also um, charges people. He puts all the parts in like the, everything's in its own little uh, Ziploc bag. And we, if the person, needs a lamp part and doesn't have it, we can say you can go down the street, the hardware store, ask them to, to give you the XYZ, or if you want to buy it here and we have it, we charge the, the visitor exactly what it costs us to have it. Many people will also bring in something that they think is the missing replacement, but they don't know enough to know that it's the correct thing. Yeah. So we have a budget for lamp supply parts we have a we have donation jars out saying we the repair cafe and everything that we're doing is free but we do have expenses we don't have to pay rent but we do have to get flyers printed um and john can tell you peter mui said that you you need to be really uh, you really need to take care of your coaches to make sure they have a good time and you make need to make sure they've got good pizza for lunch that's true it usually costs us about 80 dollars for pizza yeah. Um, those are the two major expenses. The bike, re our bike repairs, um, one of the coaches owned his own bike repair shop uh, for 49 years. So he tells us what are the basic parts we need to stock. And he, he brings those in. John, do you want to add to that? Well, simply to say that you would probably be surprised at how few repairs actually require parts. True. Most repairs, something, a uh, connection has been lost. And in many cases, the repair is simply cleaning. 
that or the bulbs dead for the lamp. <laughs> okay. Um, what else you got, Rachel? Okay, now they're coming in. Wonderful. So from Kate, any ideas on what we can do now to encourage repair while we are in lockdown? Uh, John can tell you about that. Yeah, you know, they're starting back in the spring. There have been a lot of efforts around the world to have virtual repair events on Zoom. So these have gotten better and better. And the next one is this Sunday. Uh, it is coming from Sweden, is uh, originating in Sweden. And so we call this Global Fixers. And uh, you can find out information and uh, you know, get in, you know, register to bring an item, or if you are on the fixing side of things, you can register to be a repair coach. When you go to a virtual repair event, it's a Zoom, you see a big gallery of people from around the world. I participated in a bunch of these. They are really fun. They are very interesting. And, um, and they begin, they've been, been getting more and more successful uh, because Zoom, you can go to breakout rooms. And so the, the find out about the one this Sunday, uh, December 13th, uh, go to uh, fixitclinic.org, fixitclinic.org, and you'll get the information. I really encourage you to do that because these are people from all around the world. It truly is a global community. It's fantastic. Also go to Repair Cafe TV. And there are past episodes of, um, mm, of the interactive virtual repairs. Yeah, virtual repair. If you guys think of new ones in the next 24 hours, other ones that you thought of after this is over, would you send them to me? And I will send out that sure. list when I Great. send everybody the link for the YouTube sure. video. So I, I can share that with everybody. Hey, that yeah. You guys have got a lot of resources. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, Rachel. All right, our next one is from Monica. And we kind of touched a little bit on this around making sure our volunteers are well fed. Um, even though everyone is volunteering, what do you need a budget for and how would you go about raising those kinds of funds? Well, the, the budget is ma mainly for those small scale parts uh, for the printing of flyers, unless you can get a sponsor who's willing to do that for you. The, there's not much that you need the overhead for. And we put out, as I said, a donation jar with the sign that says, if you can support some of the, the expenses, we would appreciate it. We also have the cafe where there's food and snacks and you can put in a donation jar there. We've been able to run our cafe with just, just the cash that comes in that day. Oh my goodness, people are so generous. They're so grateful. I mean, the, the, the level of gratification is so high on both sides of the table. The guys and gals who do the repairs, the people who bring their items to be repaired. It's really just, you know, a lot of stuff gets fixed. People leave very happy. And we often get um, parts from things. One of our repair coaches uh, fixes bicycles, even when the repair cafe is not in session. We've we're asked by the mayor to contact the police department because there are so many abandoned bikes. Rich drives around town, goes to the police department, collects them up, scavenges the parts from that in order to be able to repair bikes at the repair cafe. Yeah. So it's part of it's uh -huh. just kind of being keeping the stuff out of the landfill. Yeah, and I saw Alan on your flyers, you know, you have a partnership with the Restore and I saw it come through the chat, you know, uh, partnering with Habitat for Humanity. Those are your natural partners. It's really terrific. Yeah. Uh, some repair cafes also have relationships with local hardware stores who will donate um, mm -hmm. either the actual tools or, or a discounted version of buying the tools. A number of our re repair coaches, one of them, um, it's how they're connected in business. One of them works for a company that manufactures signs. He makes our banners and the company writes it off. Another one, uh, they, they print the flyers. Yeah, the point is, is that people really see how this strengthens communities. This is, uh, you know, a tremendous way to build resilience within your own communities. It's a great motivator for people, and they just see the positive benefit of it. Okay, Rachel. All right. This one is from Daniel. Um, what advice would you have for insurance and safety mm -hmm. around a repair fair? Well, safety is not involved. Uh, you know, you're, you're really asking everyone to use their common sense. We are very clear with the repair coaches and, and you know, everyone who comes to a repair event, uh, we have the house rules clearly listed. And Alan, this is something that we could send on to you, but certainly folks, uh, all of this is well covered in the Repair Revolution 
book. Um, safety is common sense. The insurance question always comes up, but I will tell you that it is all very easily answered. And in most, almost every case, the basic insurance uh, that is carried by your host venue is totally, um, you know, um, adequate to your purpose. Perfect. That's, that's what you want to hear because insurance always is a bugaboo, right? Mm -hmm. so, yeah. well, well, not always. Yeah. Only only two repair cafes in the, what, nearly 40 in the Hudson Valleys require any other insurance and mine is one of them. Mm -hmm. yeah. But the sustainability organization that um, I was a member of, underneath their umbrella organization, we were able to, get, able to get it. And now through John, we're going to be able to get it through the sustainability organization for the whole Hudson Valley. So. But as I said, we're two out of 40. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's not an obstacle. It's always a question and it's a good question, but it has, um, it has never been an obstacle. And as John said, there's the actual um, documentation in the book with the text that we use on the job ticket that says, basically, um, I'm bringing you this item to be repaired. I'm taking the risk. I can't, uh, there's, this is on, on me. I've chosen it. And we have to re reinforce with the coaches before every repair cafe. Remember, don't work on anything until somebody has signed the waiver. But we've never had a problem. Mm -hmm. So Daniel, this is uh, for you. Since you've heard that the insurance is not an issue, we expect a, a repair cafe down in Corvallis there where you are. So we're looking forward to it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's really, it's not a heavy lift. And, you know, uh, as in anything, gather a group of friends who enjoy working together, uh, who are creative, who will make this fun. And uh, I guarantee, you know, as much as I can guarantee, uh, you will, you will be glad you did. What else we got, Rachel? Okay, so we have uh, from Cindy, and this is a great question. I think, Alan, you and I have kind of heard this too, when talking about uh, repair fairs and tool libraries and libraries of things. In regards to a tool library, how are people prevented from keeping the tool? Is there a refundable deposit? Well, I would say go to, you know, uh, I know Robin uh, in the chat said that there's a repair, I'm sorry, there's a tool library in Eugene. Simply, you know, search Eugene Tool Library and you will see how they run it, you know, what their policy are, it, what their policies are, what their rules are. It's pretty straightforward. Yeah, I, I, I personally don't have any no idea what, the, what that is. So um, I'm sure there must be some way that they keep track of all that stuff. Oh yeah, they do. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's as I say, it's, it's kind of a, what you would imagine. Uh, but here's an important thing to say. All of this builds trust within a community. And that is, um, that can't be underestimated as a, as a core value to this. When we talk about community repair, which includes tool libraries, these are ways of building trust within your community. And Lord knows what a wonderful thing that is. Yeah. And I would add, you know, if you're uh, really in uh, deep contact with all the things your local library can do. I mean, anything from, you know, uh, group reading book packs to ukuleles to, um, you yes. know, energy meters can yes. get checked out through most regular library systems. Yes. So um, those are things beyond books. And in the same way, um, we kind of have that system that people check out books and bring them yeah. back. Yeah. And really, you know, think of it, libraries are the original, you know, share, shared economy. Uh, I mentioned earlier that the American Library Association is a tremendous champion and supporter of all of the things we're talking about today. And Richard, then, do you have any more questions? Um, I think maybe one that you could maybe elaborate on a little bit more than I Alan, because I wasn't er around for this repair fair. Um, talking about the talk touched about ha um, partnering with Habitat for Humanity. Um, and can you talk a little bit about how we've used that before in uh, one of the repair fairs? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How we use that in one of the repair fairs? Yeah, well, the partnership with the Restore, Alan. Oh, OK, yeah. Yeah, we had one of the great things with the partnership was there. We were also. Um, it also helped us with gaining a couple of fixers uh, because they had so many volunteers. 
uh, that are very knowledgeable in that kind of thing. And then also there was a, a you know, obviously when you think about what's the, the materials that are there, those were available too for either free or just negligible costs because if somebody needed a, a washer or you know a, a, a screw or something like that it was all there because you know it's a habitat restore and they're well stocked so that was a, a a real benefit for having it there plus they gave us the space and it was all you know it was all free and uh, it was with with welcoming arms and that was a plus so um it's also a place that it's it's great pr for them because a lot of those people who mm -hmm. came to that repair fair um they had never been there before yeah. And so it was an opportunity for them to walk through. They had to walk through the Habitat Restore. We set it up that way on purpose as opposed to coming through the back door, which where it was actually yeah. set up. Um, yeah. It would have been easier, but they one that way they got to see what there was available yeah. in that store and learned that, hey, wait, I can save a ton of money and keep stuff out of the landfill. And there again, that's the attribute of a good partnership, right? And mm -hmm. a partnership, both sides, you know, both uh, both participants need to be, you need to see value in what you're doing. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, right. you know, repair culture, you know, it's about, you know, extending the useful life of things that you care about or rely on. Uh, it, it's, mm -hmm. it's about uh, feeding your curiosity about the way things work. It's about using tools and using your hands. Uh, it's about acknowledging and, and honoring and, and passing on the, this kind of knowledge. You know, it's, it's sharing skills, reducing waste, making friends. And there's, I'd, I'd like to take a minute just to read you. One of my volunteers is a 13 year old boy who needed a community service hours um, through his Catholic church, 13. I asked him, you know, what did he think of this experience? Because he, he was getting to be a regular and he said, and I quote, it's nice to know that with the news saying so many sad and depressing stories, there's a place where there are people who are willing to help you, no matter who you are, for no other reason than to help you in the best way possible. It gives me hope. A kid. It's just humbling. Yeah, that's great. That's a great okay. thing. Well, Elizabeth, thank you so much. John, thank you so much. It's a great book. If you folks that are out there are interested, I would strongly encourage you to find a way to get a copy. Um, and because uh, it's a, it'll be a great resource to you and your community, or, uh, especially if you decide you want to take that, take you know, starting one up um, around and you're looking for like, well, how do I get started here? It's all there. Uh, again, there's repair tips in there. And um, the philosophy, it's all there. It's, it is a, it's very um, comprehensive. And so I would strongly encourage it. If you're in the uh, Marion County area, if you've got questions, you can come to us at Environmental Services. We've got a connection. We've got the email address on the uh, resources there. And, um, and there's a lot of resources out there to, to find throughout wherever you are. So, and I, I love the idea that somebody could actually participate in a repair event coming out of Sweden. Um, so most of us are not gonna be going to Sweden in the next few months. So um, there you have it. Yeah. Alan, I just wanna say quickly, I saw in the chat, somebody was asking about how do you sort of profile the coaches and what you need from one. Um, we have a whole letter for a prospective coach that says, this, these are the things that we're, we're looking for. Technical skills are great, but, it, but it's, it's a good communicator and not being frustrated if you don't have the time or the parts you need to fix it. But all that's profiled in one of the letters in the appendix also. Yeah. Again, it's, it's, it's a, it's, it's a one-stop shopping in that book. Bye -bye. <laughs> hey, thank you guys so much. I appreciate you taking your time today. This has been a Marion County Environmental Services virtual event. And thank you all for participating today. And with that, I'm going to stop the recording. Thank you all. It's been a pleasure. Thank you.